everybody. Welcome to That Expert Show, where you help run the show. I'm Anna Canzano. Thanks so much for joining us. We are talking about parenting today. This is a great topic. It's so relatable. All of us feel like we've just got it figured out as parents, and then something changes with our kids and we're in a whole new territory with things to figure out. Our guest today is the parenting and child and family expert uh, when it comes to breaking news situations for CBS and Fox News LA. She is a guest expert on the CBS show The Doctors and she is currently in private practice in Beverly Hills. She also authored the groundbreaking book The Self-Aware Parent, Resolving Conflict and Building a Better Bond with your child. Joining me live from Los Angeles today is Dr. Fran Walfish. Dr. Fran, thanks so much for being with us. Thank you, Anna. I'm delighted to be with you and your audience. <laughs> you know, it's so fun to talk about this topic because I think a lot of people um, you know, we'll fully admit, like I'll be the first to admit that we have so much to learn as parents. We've got uh, little ones, we've got a teenager, and there is just so much information out there. Sometimes it's hard to really sort through the differing opinions on, on good parenting advice. Absolutely. I think right now, 2019 is just about the hardest time to parent children because there is too much uh, material, abundance of opinion, and parents are confused. They don't know who or what to do. Who do they like, listen to? And that's why we're so fortunate to have you. If you don't mind, I'm just gonna jump right into some of the questions that people have posted on Facebook and Twitter. Um, Colby is writing that the smallest things can leave the biggest emotional scars sometimes. Is there any way to practice parenting that won't put your kid in therapy when they're in their 20s? <laughs> well, first of all, no one had perfect parents. And Colby uh, writes with um, being quite general. She's not really saying what those small things are. So I'll take the leap and make the assumption that what she's talking about is the relationship chemistry between mother and child. And she wants to know how to keep the fire down so that small things don't escalate into power struggles and battles. I live behind the line of fire every hour, new children, families, parents, and child come into the office. And the problem is that parents forget kids need to be angry. And parents need to not only allow for anger, they need to encourage and invite healthy expression of anger and displeasure. And the best place to express it is the person they feel most safe with, their parents. Now that does not mean that it's okay to disrespect your parent. And there's a fine line be between how does the child express anger and yet still stay respectful? So for example, the kid can say, mom, dad, I don't like your rules. I don't like that you make me turn the TV off and take a bath. I hate taking a bath. <laughs> I've heard that. But, I might have heard that last night. <laughs> yeah. But the kid cannot say, I hate your guts and want a different mom. Okay, so that the, makes sense. So that's the definite, that, that's the difference between a healthy expression of anger and a non-healthy expression of anger. That's one example of that. So then as a parent, how do you respond to that? Because I think sometimes as parents, we're tempted to... I don't know, squash down the kid's feelings and, you know, I even catch myself sometimes trying to get a kid like not to feel that way or not to say that, but that's not particularly healthy because I think kids, like adults, need affirmation. Absolutely. The most common responses are get over it, shut up and be quiet, or the parent collapses into tears mm -hmm. and cannot handle being the target of that rage. 
So the best way to handle it, surprise, surprise, parents, is to validate the feeling, empathize with the child, and say something like, in a calm, accepting tone of voice, I see and I hear you. You're mad at me. I understand that. It's hard to stop when you want more. I get it. I'm so glad you told me. Come, I will help you. Click off the TV and walk into the bathroom. What that will do is trigger a tantrum. If you've got a five or a six-year-old, even if you're empathic, your child's still not going to like not getting what he wants in that moment, that is a golden opportunity to give your child a chance to grow and experience a letdown, a disappointment. All of us experience disappointments pretty much daily. And so every time you allow your child to not get what he or she wants and you empathize with patience and compassion, you're building her muscles to equip her to go out into the world and bear the pain of disappointment. Hmm. So that, that's tricky because I get all that and like mentally that makes sense to me as a parent, but when I'm dealing with my four-year-old and I really just need her to get to the bath because it's bedtime, um, you're saying have patience, but then how do I progress from empathizing and validating her displeasure with having to take a bath and actually getting her to do it, besides okay. physically dragging her to the bathtub? That is a fabulous question, and it's a great follow-up question, because so many parents today have read more books than I have. They know all the right things to say, but they do not know what to do. And the answer is, take action. So along with your empathic words and attunement, when you say it's hard to stop and it's hard not to get what you want, show mommy how you can turn off the TV or mom's going to help you. Hmm. You, wait, you wait a silent beat of two and then move. Hmm. Click your remote off your child will scream a holy terror, put your arm around her waist, walk her to the bathroom. Don't pick her up because that's infantilizing. Mm. Walk her to the bathroom so she learns that the power of her rage does not get her out of her responsibility. You helped her show up to her next responsibility in the bathroom and that's where you settle her down before you put her in the bathtub mm -hmm. she can have her tantrum in the bathroom you're gonna stay calm and say i hear you you're mad i know you're mad <laughs> and when you come down we're gonna mommy's gonna help you get in the water <laughs> oh boy these are uh, these are lofty goals and i hear what you're saying it's just uh it's uh, it's challenging sometimes to like carry them out in action, but I appreciate the advice to try and head in that direction. We have another great question. This one's from Heather. She says that one of her big struggles is helping her kids, especially her youngest, understand that failing is part of succeeding. Um, she is so afraid to fail, she means her daughter, to the point that she would rather not turn in an assignment uh, than turn in something that she considers less than perfect. Um, she says that she's, they've been to therapists that tried to help her reason out, you know, what's the worst that could happen here in terms of failing, but she's looking for any advice that you have to overcome this. Okay. This is a good segue because just from the last question, consistency, repetition, and continuity is what helps your child reduce the frequency and intensity of those tantrums. And it's a, a great segue to this one because this is not exactly a fear of failure, or I should say it's not only a fear of failure, it's coupled with 
the sister sibling of perfectionism. That child who doesn't want to try for fear of failing is really um, holding a very, very high bar for themselves. They cannot tolerate not getting the outcome exactly matching their mind's eye of perfect. And so what you want to do is loosen up the rigidity of expectation. So parents need to say again with empathy, it must be so hard to be in your skin because you never give yourself a break. It's like you don't give yourself room for making a mistake. And that's how we learn is from our mistakes. You're so hard on yourself. And the more you do that, the more the child, child, it can be very young, three, four-year-olds can have perfectionism up to more commonly teenagers. And the more you give that gentle empathic message, the more the kid internalizes the message and takes it in and has that own voice of, okay, I'm being hard on myself, maybe I'll incrementally give it a try, take a step toward trying. And if I don't do what I want to do, maybe it's not the end of the world. I see a lot of teenagers who really feel desperate and they don't get straight A's. There's a desperation and that expectation is not always coming from their parents and the environment. It is often coming from comparing themselves to their peers. Well, yeah, and I think, you know, even with social media and the fact that everybody's got a phone now and everybody's on Instagram and you're constantly seeing perfected versions of other people's lives, I would think that only intensifies um, a, a teenager's uh, need, the feeling of that need to be perfect because they're seeing so much, quote unquote, perfection around them. Absolutely. It's perfectionism, the... the uh, pictures and images of models, actors, actresses looking perfect and their peers. But what's even worse is the public platform for shaming. And kids in school have always said, what do you get on the test? How do you, what, what's your score? And there's a lot of pressure to uh, fess up to what your score is. And there's a tremendous amount of posting um, numbers, pictures, images, slurs, put downs, blames, tremendous shaming that teenagers have to deal with. And it's really painful. Yeah, I mean, I, I think, you know, we can all think back to high school and you kind of knew who the popular kids were um, in your mind, but you didn't have a numerical way to compare everyone. Like the, the example that I've heard is like, two girls in high school can buy the exact same shirt at the store. Both of them will post a photo, a selfie of them, self, uh, wearing that shirt on Instagram. One girl gets 500 likes and the other gets 100. So now you're giving teenagers uh, an actual statistical numerical way to judge themselves against one another in terms of who is more or less popular. And that is so painful. So what advice um, can you offer additionally for parents of teenagers who you know don't have that developed frontal cortex yet and are dealing with that kind of uh, pressure? Well, Advice number one is keep the communication pathways wide open. You want your teens to talk with you. That's the key point. And it does begin at a younger age. You don't like suddenly expect a teenager to tell you everything mm -hmm. if you have not 
facilitated and developed, encouraged that from, you know, the early years. So, but you can, um, if you didn't, you know, do that in the beginning. So one is you want to open the pathways of straight talk with your teens. Number two, I think parents need to not be afraid of exerting their authority as they are today and recognize, yes, teens need privacy, but independence and privacy is earned. And the way it's earned is through demonstration of responsible behavior. What is responsible behavior? Your teen listens to and abides by curfew, homework, bedtimes, doing their household chores, and talking with you. And if you've got a teen who is open with you, then you know you can give them some space. Mm -hmm. However, however, when does a kid need their door closed? Does a teenager ever need their door locked? No, I don't think so. They can have, you can have an understanding. If the door is closed, maybe your teenager is changing clothes. So you knock. But you also have the right to look at and cruise their cell phones, their computers, all electronics. You need to know who they're chatting with. I can give you example after example of the loveliest teenage boys and girls who come from very fine, privileged families with good grades, who shocked their parents, <laughs> and sometimes me, <laughs> by <laughs> chatting with a stranger online, taking risky behaviors, and even maybe considering meeting a stranger through chatting and having conversations. You need to have open, straight talk with your kids about the pitfalls, the dangers, and not be afraid to say, and I'm going to look mm -hmm. randomly and every now and then and occasionally, and that's okay. And it, if your child or teenager says, you don't trust me, you can say, I do trust you. I don't trust the internet <laughs> and, and all the strangers that we don't know who are on there using it. Yeah, it's like the Wild West out there, to be sure. And part of our problem is that uh, the teenager in the household is so much more adept at technology and social media that there are apps that she'll use or techniques that she has that we can't quite figure out. So it's almost like you have to recruit somebody who's roughly within that same uh, age frame to actually figure out what's going on sometimes, because that, that can be challenging uh, in itself. Uh, Pam has an interesting question, and this makes for an interesting segue, because she's got a 19-year-old old and hopefully you're not going to say that it's too late for her because she says she has a 19 year old she wants to know how to get that 19 year old to call or text her just to say hi and chat uh, she's in Oregon Pam is in North Carolina she stayed behind when they moved they didn't have a choice in moving and Pam saying that her teen will text her if she needs something or has an important question but she just misses hearing how she is and how her days are going so what do you do with the non-communicative older teenager that is no longer under your roof? Okay, that's a really good question. What we're talking about is the attachment and separation process. Now, attachment begins in the first 12 months of life, bonding through breastfeeding and the mother-child dyad. And for the rest of that kids life experience parents 
need to understand reasonable, age-appropriate separation. So by the time a, a kid reaches age 18, leaves home and goes to college, s- separation should be resolved. And yet, what is reasonable contact? your teenager will not tell you everything and you hopefully have finished your job of developing character good morals healthy judgment Mm -hmm. and behavioral choices so your teenager and young adult can go out into the world and college and thrive however for personal, emotional needs, we want relationships. So I would say once a week, contact on the phone, Skype, or FaceTime is reasonable and healthy. Let's assume from that uh, question that the teenager is not doing that much. It sounded like she calls or uh, reaches out to mom when she needs something. That's what it said. Mm -hmm. So mom can say, listen, you know, I can't be stupid. She can use humor so it isn't heavy. Mm -hmm. And so she doesn't inject guilt into that uh, young adult. And just say, look, I can't be dumb. I can't just keep sending you $100 bills <laughs> or care packages if I don't also have a relationship that we keep on going together. So I would like us to agree to every Sunday morning or every Saturday afternoon or whatever is reasonable that we mutually agree upon once a week, we're going to have a 10 minute phone call. Mm -hmm. And then it feels comfortable for me to do all the other extras. Now, there are a lot of parents who have, and you know, we've heard about the helicopter parents, a lot of parents who want much more contact. I see parents who want daily contact with their college kids. That's too much. And I have to help those parents let go. Oh, I know what you're talking about. My mom almost moved down with me to college and bought a house near my campus. That didn't happen. Uh, But uh, I can definitely relate to that. Here's an interesting question uh, from Facebook from Xavier, who says that being a stepfather specifically to two boys, um, literally, quote, sigh, any help or advice would help, end quote. He wrote sigh, mm-hmm. S-I-G-H. Yes. <laughs> I missed, are the teenage boys teenagers? You know, yeah. I can't tell um, from his post, but uh, I just I, know that he's a stepfather to two boys, yeah. Two boys. Um, well, point number one. Xavier, thanks for writing in. That's a great question. Uh, Don't push or force it. Follow the kid's lead. My nickel bets one is more open to you and the other one pushes you a little bit further away based on the personality, temperament, and the mix, the chemistry between that teen and you. So don't force it because you'll only make that kid push you harder away. Um, Talk with your spouse about how to handle discipline and let their birth mother do the hard labor of discipline and develop special time with each boy. So what that means is talk to the kids and tell them you want individual alone time with each one of them where you let them pick 20 minutes or 30 minutes, it can be in the house, of something they love to do 
and you'll do it with them. I don't care if you go in the kitchen and scoop, each of you scoop your own ice cream cone and you sit and eat ice cream together and you just look at him and put tape on your mouth and just listen to what he's up to. And eye to eye gaze makes for developing a good connected relationship. Mm -hmm. So less is more when it comes to talking or pushing and do lots of listening with interest. You know, it's interesting because as, as you talk, I'm, all these things are coming to my mind um, of the, you know, you're talking about the things that we should do as parents, and this is fantastic advice. Um, in your years of practicing, what are the top mistakes that you see parents making that we should avoid? Okay, great question, great question. The number one top mistake that I see today is parents who are afraid to set limits and hold the line and take action to follow through. And the reason is they're so invested in their kids liking them hmm. all the time. So that's number one. Number two, communication breakdowns. So um, teens, even young kids today, take a teenage posture and they will fight back and resist their parents with a defiant tone of voice, become disrespectful, and parents get caught in fighting back rather than taking a step back, trying to understand what is my kid struggling with, what's not feeling good right now, and talking right to that issue with empathy and understanding. So remember where the power lies. You, the parent, are the holder of power and privilege. Your child deserves respect so that you listen and the child has a voice, but you get the final vote. Families are not a democracy. <laughs> Kids do not get an equal vote. Parents can trump their kids' vote. Otherwise, I will tell you, you will submit to your kids' demands and be angry, frustrated, desperate, hopeless and land in my office. <laughs> so that's one of them. So maintain your control as a parent. Um, you know, don't get too caught up in the idea that your kid has to like you. It's a fine line because you want them to like you so that they'll talk to you. And yet you still have to maintain that level of authority over them and maintain boundaries for them. Otherwise they're just um, chaotic and, and don't have any boundaries, which makes everybody unhappy. Are there other things that um, you see parents doing that we should definitely avoid? Yes. Equip your children with the skills to deal with life's disappointments. Don't be afraid to let your child fall down. They need to experience the sting of temporary letdown and have you empathize with their struggle so that they can develop the muscles and the tools to deal with life's inevitable daily disappointments. I love it. The next one, be kind to your kids. You know, a lot of parents forget that and they talk to their kids like an employee, like they're uh, a pal or a spouse, and they lose their temper quickly. And let's face it, we are now living very, very, very busy, demanding lives. Today, it takes two paychecks to make ends meet. <clears throat> we have 
overbooked and overstretched parents and children. So everyone is short fused. And when you come home, parents, turn off your cell phones, have a cup of coffee, go to your kids. I don't care if it's 15 minutes, give them quality, sustained eye contact, ear focus, listen, and make that very needed bridge of connection. Mm -hmm. The kids really want it. They may not tell you, but they really want it. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I appreciate that. Wow, Dr. Friend, thank you so much. This has been just a wealth of fantastic uh, information based on your practice, and I know based on the research that you've done over the years. Again, uh, the author of The Self-Aware Parent, Resolving Conflict and Building a Better Bond with Your Child. Uh, just great advice that you shared with us today. Thanks so much for being with us. Thank you, Anna. <laughs> and thank you for joining us, viewers of That Expert Show. Hope you got something out of this show today. Um, if you have follow-up questions, feel free to hit me up on Twitter or Facebook and just let me know. I can always continue to field your questions to Dr. Fran. I'm on Facebook at Anna Canzano. I'm on Twitter and Instagram at That Expert Show. And if you didn't happen to catch this live, but you'd like to go back and see it, we always post these interviews with our experts on our YouTube channel, That Expert Show. And, you know, sometimes I know it's easier just to take in a podcast and listen to the show. So we're also available wherever you do that. Apple Podcasts or Google Play, TuneIn, Stitcher, all those different platforms. So, hey, thanks again for joining us. Let me know your feedback. And, you know, I would love your help sharing uh, this particular episode or telling your friends about the show. Give us a retweet or share it on your Facebook page. You can share this information with the people in your life who you think might benefit from it. Tag them on it if you want and help us spread the word that we're putting good information out into the world, talking to fantastic experts who really know their stuff. All right, that's it for this episode of That Expert Show, where you help run the show.